of the Enhancing Crop Productivity and Utilisation theme at the James Hutton Institute, but also the Chair of Food Chemistry at Harriet Watt University. Great. Um, Derek, can you just tell me, you know, food and beverage regulation is designed to protect the consumer. Is that your view? Um, it has its places, that, and I think it, it has to adhere to that paradigm. Um, I think the worry is that it's becoming very prescriptive now and is actually stifling innovation in the food industry. Um, and it's, it's doing it particularly at the EU level, which will result in innovations perhaps coming from areas like Asia and America, leading to us having to import those rather than actually generating them ourselves. Can you give me an example of the type of product that that's happening? Oh, uh, well, a- a- anything with regard to, for example, developing new food colorants, it could be new ways of actually producing foods themselves, things like genetic modification. That's a, there's a clear example where we're actually... We, we cannot really grow genetically modified crops in, in Europe at all, essentially, um, but we are importing huge amounts of it from the US. So there's a mixed message there. Yep, that sounds crazy. And, and do you think it's, it's often just one company which takes on all the work of, of developing a um, new product? I, I, I think it tends to come down to the, the companies with the biggest money. Um, now, I'm not sure. It depends on the area. If, you're, if there are solutions to be developed in the food and drink industry that will cross the board, they can possibly be better handled and driven by the, the associations from the food industries. So everyone benefits. Clearly, um, there are different ways of garnering IP and protecting your product in the food industry, which knocks collaboration on the head. Um, so it, the, the industry itself might be hoisted by its own petard. That would be a great pity, wouldn't it? That would be very sad. And, and what about GM developments in natural colour? Well, I think, they, I think we can do it. It's as simple as that. Um, the, <laughs> the plants, bacteria, fungi that we can manipulate should we want to and do it under a very regulated and strict regime. So if you want to use them, fermentation systems. So, for example, it's already been done with enzymes in the food industry, we're using GM derived enzymes um, you, you have basically an infrastructure there that can be used to generate whatever you want for the industry, whether it be food colours, whether it's functional ingredients like maybe beta-glucan that goes into foods, things like that um, it, it's a toolbox there to be used I think OK, but I mean, the issue facing um, most manufacturers now is sustainable sourcing, you know, a beverage company always has to bear in mind you know, what happens if things change Yeah. Well, interestingly, we, we, I deal with m- many of the multinationals, and they're actually now operating on a global, a global sourcing basis. Um, and they're looking now, and even things like colours, which traditionally might have been synthetic-based, so generated from fossil fuels, they're looking for renewable, sustainable sources of these, essentially serving themselves. They want to be, they want to be assured that their business will be there in perpetua Mm. Um, and that actually feeds back and the value trickles right back down the chain so you're actually getting people who are growing the crops or growing the crops for one use and the waste from it is used for another use so I think to to be honest and from an ethical point of view and a business point of view it just makes utter sense so uh, where is this coming where is can you give an example is that in the wine industry or, or um probably a good example might be uh, there was an eu project recently where we looked at um generating functional ingredients from blackcurrant waste so you process blackcurrant you use it for juice and you're left with a lot of the skin the skin's like a, a concentrated feedstock of chemicals that can be used for anything. Yeah, yeah it's the anthocyanins. Yeah. Um, and we, done, we did some studies looking at the impact on that and progression of things like Alzheimer's disease, and we actually got some beneficial effects. So it's, it tends to stop... So it's using the skins or using the water that... Was the skins uh-huh. or the extracts from the skins. Because I've heard a lot about using the, the water that's washing the fruit as well. Either or, yeah, mm-hmm. because uh, what, what you'll wash, if you're washing fruit, what you'll strip out is uh, there's a lot of potent chemicals in there that wouldn't necessarily be coloured, but they're still in there. And so you can utilise that as well. Uh, how would you use it? Uh, you can put it into juices. You can use it as a, you can maybe want to prove it as a functional additive. Um, we've... Um, because it's actually nutrient rich. Yes, mm. indeed. Or, or there's chemicals in there that may actually help protect your existing product. So it may sustain the colour for longer. Um, it helps to maintain the colour, Fantastic. but it's from a renewable resource now. So, so what was the most interesting thing you picked up on today? Is it this new blue um, that they're talking about? The new blue was really interesting, yeah. And, and do you think that's from Gardenia? I, I think I've probably got a, I've got a fair idea what it is, and it'll probably come up in my talk as well. Ah. It's an anthocyanin, 
Um, I think if it's the anthocyanin I'm talking about, it's a fairly complex molecule, but it's there's a wide range of sources for it in, in, the, in the plant kingdom and from developed crops already. So it should be fairly utilitarian to use. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. It's right, great. No Thank you. Thanks for downloading this foodbev.com podcast. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Vimeo, Google Plus and LinkedIn.